Let's finish it. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of The Closing Pitch. My name is Spiker Helms, and this is a show about people, culture, and how to create a winning lifestyle. As I look at our little recorder to make sure that we are recording, I don't want that awkward moment where we completely record, and then I have to ask Rafi to come back to the conference room slash podcast studio. <laughs> we do not have a dedicated podcast studio, but not way, yet. if you are not wondering... Yet. Um, that was the first question that Rafi asked, like, oh, hey, where's the podcast studio? <laughs> <laughs> I believe it's it's happening in the future. It's going to come to fruition. So? Oh, yeah. You know what? We're, we should just ask Papa Jaws if he could. Uh, Papa Jaws. Papa, Papa Jaws will say no yeah, right we want a sepa- <laughs> We want a separate building just for podcasting. Did you get signs on the building today? Did you see that? I saw oh, the yeah. signs. Yeah, yeah, looking good. good. Right? We're, we're, grow- good. we're growing up in the world. Hey, gets a little bit more professional each day. <laughs> we have... Rafael Lopez, that's a big league name already. I mean, <laughs> you should have you should have played in the big leagues. Oh wait, you did. Just a little, just a little, <laughs> just, just, a, just a little just bit, a little, just yeah. that little humble brag, uh-huh. little pat on the back. Could have yeah. been more, could have been less. <laughs> <laughs> I am very intrigued with this conversation because um, one, you're not a typical pro guy in my opinion. Um, and not a typical big leaguer. Like there's some awesome big leaguers that I've met mm-hmm. um, over the years. Um, but if I just saw you at like a restaurant or just met you, I wouldn't realize like, oh, that dude played in the big leagues. Yeah. Well, and I don't think he'd ever tell you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, if someone asked, I would. But really, yeah, I actually enjoy that uh, it looks that way. <laughs> <laughs> and one of our directors interviewed Jason Grilly. Mm-hmm. Um Another awesome dude, just yeah. down to earth. Um, it was a great conversation. Yeah, and it literally, he it was just common sense, practicality type of stuff. It wasn't like this rah rah, like hey, this is what it is, this is how it is, and um, and it's all right if you don't want to play in the big leagues or play college baseball. Like we're here to actually promote the game and and make it better. Now it is cool to see the big leaguers play and see how they really. Um, tactically go towards the game, mm-hmm. but it's not the end all be all when it comes down to it. it's all about life lessons and seeing how it is. But the reason I'm excited about this conversation is that I want to talk about clubhouse culture. Um, I think in youth sports, we have a little bit of a issue at times. Um, I wouldn't say issue, just the culture can get a little toxic. And if mm-hmm. you're listening to this podcast, you know exactly what I'm talking about, where it's, um, We've yeah. all heard that story, right? Yeah, it's always that. It's always that story. Like, oh, did you hear about Johnny? And then, then Johnny becomes Timmy, and then next thing you know, the parents get mad, and um, then the team blows up. Team blows and, up, yeah, and, and it's a um, terrible. And then the kids quit, and then yeah. it's not a good situation. Yeah, and I, I don't, I don't want to give um, parents some firepower. I also want to give the coaches some firepower, and obviously the players, and how they can pr- be active and promote a solid clubhouse dugout culture Mm -hmm. obviously in youth baseball you don't have a clubhouse um that was the going joke in junior college baseball like oh we're gonna go to the clubhouse (laughs) well aka my car (laughs) aka my car and locker rooms and (laughs) it's good because you played junior college baseball as well you've literally seen every single level yeah um even indie ball for uh, for a short time as well so in between big league stints so yeah kind of you name it, probably seen it. Give us, give us your background. Kind of give us like a little bit of a elevator pitch where you've played, your kind of path through professional, yeah, all the um, way up through professional. So I was like a you know, young dude, loved baseball as a kid. I actually wanted to be a NASCAR driver when I was younger, not a baseball player. <laughs> um, if someone asked me what I want to be, I'd say Dale Earnhardt. Uh, that was just kind of who I was as a kid. Parents would like, you know, I wanted a race to be on every day. So they'd copy, cool. um, they would copy races and put them in the VCR. Yeah. So that was it. But in the meantime, I would take swings with my dad with a wiffle ball bat and then just played since I was five. Um, was one of those kids who did get a little burnt out at a young age mm-hmm. and actually quit. Um, played roller hockey, some soccer, a little basketball. And then right when around 13, got back in the game. And that was a tough period for me because I stayed very small and never really grew until I got into high school. Mm-hmm. So when everyone was growing, I didn't want to play because I was mm-hmm. like, it's an unfair advantage. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I was yeah. like, puberty's an unfair advantage. But... Um, you know, decided uh, about seventh grade, all right, let's just take this serious again. Let's see where it goes. And, um, you know, just slowly grew. And as I grew, the hard work I put in, even though I was smaller and everyone started to pay off around sophomore year of high school because then I started to grow. 
So all those kids that were young growers who then got complacent were found to be a little bit in trouble with mm -hmm. their playing careers. And that's when I was able to kind of blossom. And, and give then, an idea of like, how tall are you right now? 5'8". And no, then a, a very good day. <laughs> 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 I'm wearing the extra thick yeah, spikes exactly. to get myself up off Five the ground. 5'9 on, online though. Five and nine. in high school, what were, how tall were you? I didn't get to this height till pretty much end of my sophomore year, junior year, or beginning of junior year. In high school? Year. Yeah. Wow. So recruiting was like... Yeah, it was super that tough. tough. It was looking at my dad, and he was six two, so everyone thought I was going to be this, you know, gigantic kid. And uh, no way, hoping, your dad's six yeah. two. Yeah, you, what, how tall is your mom? Ah, uh, like five three, five four. That's gonna so, be yeah. that's gonna be my kid. Yeah, like literally, yeah. like I'm six foot, like, and Shondi's five two. <laughs> yeah, it's hopefully, hopefully they get the height. You yeah, know? hopefully. <laughs> but uh, yeah, just kept just kept playing, just just kept doing whatever I could, and always used that what you're kind of mentioning where like you never really noticed he was a big league player well that's how i was as a kid was well you never noticed he could play mm -hmm. um until i played um because of my size and not being your atypical looking ball player so i mean really just use that to my advantage at all times throughout college career and then through pro and then college being a south florida kid at a small school um everyone wanted me to either go to juco or or um, go extremely small school, and I, I thought I could play D1, and so um, it's not D1's not the end all be all by mm -hmm. any means, but I thought I could. Yep. And so BC Boston College recruited me pretty heavily, and they were st in my mind it was oh I can still be in the Atlantic Coast Conference. Let's yeah let's do that. Mm -hmm. Great school, academics are fantastic, and went up there and things just didn't work out. I had mm -hmm. seniors ahead of me, probably even had some juniors ahead of me who were going to be coming back. They wanted me to pitch. Um, and it's just, I didn't come here to pitch kind of thing. And, um, so went to summer ball that year and decided I was going to leave and, cause I had bread sure that year. So it kind of worked out perfect and had some offers lined up with some smaller D ones, some D twos, um, and kind of against my dad's will said like, this is my plan and this is what I'm going to do. And went to junior college for a year and then decided, um, I was actually going to follow my girlfriend in Florida state who's now my wife, mm -hmm. and that was a part of the plan, funny mm -hmm. enough. And uh, parents were maybe a little, don't base it all on a girl or anything, but uh, that was my plan. And I was very, very convinced and sold into that plan. And it worked out and went on to Florida State as an invited walk-on. Um, oh, you had no money. No money. I had offers to other places, but I had to wait another year. So I basically, you, 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 you bet it on yourself. Did you I contact did. that coach then? Um, it was a combination of my junior college coach contacting them mm -hmm. and then them reaching out to me and, and then talking to them. Gotcha. Every other university wanted me to go back to junior college for another year, and I just would have preferred a third a extra year of playing D1, mm -hmm. being a redshirt sophomore, then junior, then senior, yep. rather than just giving those two years at the end. So it was kind of a bet on myself that if I can't make it here, then I'm not going to make it to my ultimate goal anyway. Um, and not saying you have to go D1 to make it to the big leagues, mm -hmm. but in my mind, I, that, that was how I saw things. Um, so just kind of bet on myself in that first year, they're like, you're not going to be our second baseman. And I was really, really pissed, really upset. And At I, Florida State? At Florida State. Like, okay. we have a senior ahead of you, and I kind of got a little angry back and then finally cooled down, and I – Went right to the manager's office, Mike Martin, you know. Yep. Legend. Pretty, yeah, le legend. Yeah. You know, yeah. very great coach. Uh, scary to sometimes approach at times because there's so much success. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I yep. uh, said, what do I have to do to play? That was that was it. Well, what do I have to do? Said, you're, if you can catch, you're a guy. And t give give a time frame of where where this was in Florida State's, like, um program history. yeah so buster posey had just been drafted in the first round <laughs> <laughs> they were to, pretty good you know they were super regionals every year a, and, a college yeah. world series yeah. appearance and here i am little five foot eight guy and hey, our next catcher is going to be, be rafael lopez yes, you've never caught before we want you to follow a buster and that was scary and, yeah and it still is sometimes <laughs> <laughs> um but it was at that point it was i'm betting on myself i'm sold into this Let's do it, and and this is my chance. This mm -hmm. is my chance. If I can succeed now, I may be able to succeed later. Yeah. So it's just kind of that attitude. Since I was a little kid, I'm small on everybody. Let's just do it. Like just just have at it. Buy into yourself and sell out. That's and really what it was. You you caught. So were you? Did you have to battle for a starting position, or yeah. did you? There's another kid on the team, uh, Parker Brunel. We're actually still good friends. Um, where we butted heads for a while, you know, mentally and f physically on the field, and he was the same year as me. 
And uh, he was actually on a, uh, a very large scholarship. So in my mind, it was probably playing time with him. We, we split. I probably played about 60% yeah. to 40. And then the next year, about 50-50. And the next year was pretty much my job. Dang. So, so it, was, um, it was like you climbed Mount Everest, basically. I guess. <laughs> I mean, if you, if you think about it, Did, like you literally said, all right, I'm going to walk on. No money. I mean, I don't, I don't even know the tuition for Florida State, but... Cheaper than most places. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, which is in-state, in-state. Okay, so you had that going for you, so mm-hmm. that was nice. And then um, you are facing a guy that was picked up primarily for that position. Mm-hmm. Did you catch a JC? No, I had never caught <laughs> a... I never caught <laughs> a day God. in my life. Uh, never caught a oh, day. Oh, you didn't even life. catch in high school? Nothing. Just, I was only an infielder. Oh. So, so you weren't supposed to make it, <laughs> basically. How in the world did you react to that? You um, never even played the position. I mean, so I know. After that, the. Uh, but the I'm just thinking in my coach. head, like, you're jumping into 93, 94 mile an hour fastballs that move. In the ACC. In yeah. The ACC. I mean, was, like, oh, yeah, we're going to face Miami. Yeah. Like, we're facing Miami uh, next weekend. So, good luck. It was, yeah, it was very much thrown into the fire. And, you know, the machine was my, was my friend and enemy. Um, but I, I had to learn off a machine and just catching bullpen after bullpen. During that time, I actually had two knee surgeries as well from get, trying to catch. I actually hurt both knees and had two <laughs> meniscus surgeries. So I'd sit on a stool, you know, very low to the ground, uh, a little like, you know, little stepper for kids to get to their sink, and I'd catch bullpens on that and off the machine on that That's so insane. I could stay. This is your sophomore year? This was my redshirt sophomore year, so third year of college, second year as a yeah. – you know, well, honestly, athlete, yeah. honestly, I've, I've heard of, posi- <laughs> Jesus, bro. I've heard of, posi- I've heard of position changes all the time. Like an infielder goes to corner outfield or some, or vice versa, or, you know, a guy who played on the left side now moves to the right side of the infield. I don't think I've ever heard of a guy who's never caught being told in a big power five conference. Hey, now we'd like you to try to that position. So what's really cool about what you just said and people, I don't think realize, and this is a hair off topic, but there's so many parts of baseball that are all identical. Um, you're just doing them slightly differently. So everything's just a slight difference. An overhand throw and a sidearm throw is, is almost the same. One's hitting, one's throwing. Mm-hmm. Um, so when you have an infielder who's throwing sidearm well, um, they're, you can actually teach them to hit just from teaching them how to throw sidearm. It's, it's very interesting. The footwork at shortstop when you're turning a double play is almost identical to the footwork at catcher. Uh, it's just a slight difference. Um, that footwork you have to get yourself turned to throw to first base as a shortstop is almost identical as getting yourself turned to throw to, to second base as a mm. catcher. So they were able, how I use in my teaching now is similar how they taught me was just like you're playing short and you're trying to get rid of it quick. Just jab, jab, go. Hmm. And so it was able to So they specifically to tailored it to you. They tailored learning to catch with infield phrasing. Um, and that's how I teach is usually – that's cool. Or even a football player, like when you're down in this position, feel that same way with your upper body as you would football or basketball. Man, that is crazy. That's so cool. So they were able to word things for me that could catch on quicker, and then it was just work ethic at that so point. So what was their recommendation when you started seeing, like, massive cutters? Um, <laughs> do your best. <laughs> uh, but we'd go to the machine, and he'd, you know, put on a massive cutter. And, and, I mean, they literally took me to the cage the first day with the mask out of class the next day after we had the meeting and pulled me out of class, took me to the batting cage, went to the locker first, grabbed my infielder's glove, and in front of me threw it in the trash can and then handed me a catcher's mitt with a mask. Um, and literally in street clothes, they were already, you know, sinkers, cutters, here we go. Now, were you the smallest guy on the team? Um, that, yeah, that year, yeah, yeah, every year, that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you're in a major role mm-hmm. and you're five eight. And they hand you, you've never played catcher before, and they give you the glove and say, good luck. Let's go win yeah. some ball games. Yeah, I mean, they, they worked with me. Don't get me wrong. Um, well, I mean, that's, that's a but, testament to the coaching staff mm-hmm. and obviously you. And they, I mean, they probably, probably wasn't the best either at the beginning. And they, they definitely gave me they just that kept opportunity on working with to you. kind of grow yeah. and, and not like, all right, we may lose a few ball games early, but we're looking at the end of this year and honestly for the next two years. Yep. So they were – because I had arm strength. I had very, very good arm strength. So oh, they, okay. And I could hit. So they were like, if we can teach you to catch, like. Oh, we got we got something. You you might be a big leader kind of attitude. Oh, really? So, so it was that type of conversation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you just, obviously you bought in. Because, I mean, it takes, it takes two yeah. tango on that one. <clears throat> like the coaching cases, staff has to be willing. Yep. The player has to be willing. And I know how it is. There's, like there, 
you want to make sure the kid has a good experience playing well. So. I mean, and honestly, most most kids are not good nowadays for sure. Not good at jumping adapting. out of their well, comfort zone like that. Adapting, like just adapting to it. That like is a shock to the system. That's like, whoa! You don't want me to play middle infield? That's all I've ever done. It, like, it was. I'm, mid- I'm a middle it, infielder. It was that way, but at the same time, it's <clears> uh, it, it's no different than anything else. Uh, at some point, you you have to accept a change. Yep. Um, if you want to a keep playing or b whatever it is in life, I don't care what could be. You're going to the army. You could it could be coaching. It could be yep. you know dog mm-hmm. whatever. At some point, you have to accept some sort of change and be able and be willing to work at that change and be uncomfortable with it. A big saying we had in the in the clubhouse, and I know that's where we're going yeah. too with this as well was was um, get uncomfortable get comfortable being uncomfortable mm-hmm. was a big saying for us. Get comfortable being uncomfortable Mm -hmm. and it's yeah it sounds like an oxymoron but when you think about it it actually makes perfect sense yep um Um, so that was kind of a big thing was we know how uncomfortable you are let's do everything we can to in these uncomfortable situations be as confident strong as you would be playing infield Mm -hmm. and it it actually does kind of evolve to where in my mind i was just playing infield facing a different direction yeah and with a couple other little details obviously well i see uh, in high school obviously the um, high school spring coaches will put them in positions that, oh, you're going to play outfield this spring. And then we, they come back to summer baseball, and then they'll say, oh, I haven't played middle infield for the whole spring. And it's like, well, don't tell me that. Go out and do it because I'm expecting you to go play, and you've committed to that, right? Mm-hmm. So I, that's le- not my knowledge, so go out there and play and go out there and adapt to the situation. Mm-hmm. Or even if I say, all right, we're going to go put you in the outfield today, it's like, oh, I don't play outfield. <laughs> That's not a really good answer. <laughs> I mean, I would just want you to play. Right. Like, get out there. I'm trying to find a spot for you to play because I love your bat. I love your attitude. Um, right now, we have this guy that's doing really, really well at shortstop. Let's put you in the outfield. And, I mean, it seems like a lot of players don't have that adaptability, per se. Nowadays. I would agree. Um, I think part of it is un- being uncomfortable. Um, mm-hmm. and, and they also they want to look good for other people. Yeah, uh, it's, we always want to look good for other people, whether work or however it is. And I think with kids, is they're scared to look bad, that they immediately not that they want to immediately have an excuse, but they immediately want to have a reason to like, okay, if well if I mess up, I haven't played infield in, in four months, just as kind of like a disclaimer in a sense, like yeah. anyone would with a product. So I think that's just a natural instinct people is just to be defensive for themselves. But at the same time, that's when like you, the end of the day, you just want to be on the ball field. Mm-hmm. And I think that's when kids and you just go, yep, I got it. Let's go. And if you make an error, you make an error. Yeah. We're expecting you to, Yeah. if we're just throwing you in the outfield because we want you to play, if you mess up, we're not going to be angry. We knew we took that risk as a coach. And mm-hmm. that's, I think a really good opportunity to then teach or vice versa, infield catch, whatever I can, uh, and uh, one of um, we came to Florida State the same year. He was two years younger than me. He ended up being a first round draft pick for the Cardinals, uh, and he came in as a second baseman. And they moved him to right field, um, ended up being a first rounder. So I mean, if he said no, this kid probably never plays a game at second base in his college career. He didn't make it to the big leagues, but he signed as a first round draft pick, and he made some money, and made it to AAA. Yeah, and now he's a coach at Georgia Tech. So it's. You know, at some point, you as a kid, parent, I think a big thing is the parents is being, you know what, I may not like this, but if my kid's playing, like, just make him as good as you can be at that position. Yeah. Because another coach is going to see him and be like, you know what, you actually are a second baseman, and now we're going to teach you to play second at the college level. It's no different. If they can teach me to catch at the college level, why can't they teach a kid to play a different position? Yeah. And there's a difference between being romantic about a position and then committing to a position. Like I was so romantic about shortstop. Like that's all I wanted to play. We all like, are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, and I and I was just like, I'm gonna play shortstop one of these seasons, right? And I just kept on like putting myself there, and they'd be like, oh, no, 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 go to go to second base. Like, no, 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 go to right field. No, 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 go to center field. But I wasn't committed to shortstop. I was willing to say, all right, let's. I'm, I'm fine with that as long as I'm getting my bats and actually mm-hmm. playing. Like, playing is way better than me sitting on the pine right. and literally watching Jimmy hit a whole bunch of home runs, and I'm sitting on the bench and not having a lot of fun. So. Anyways, I want to get into the clubhouse aspect yeah. because you've seen a lot of different cultures. Um, obviously, we all know how junior college culture is. <laughs> it's different. <laughs> it's fun in too. a great oh, way. In yeah. a great way. Well, one of our alumni <clears throat> called me up, and um, he's not—he's in transfer portal, like all the all 
all of America. Like everyone. It yeah. seems like. Yeah. Um, good kid. Um, really, really love talking to him. But he's like, Spike, I mean, I thought you were so full of it on junior college baseball. But, like, I don't know if this makes sense, but it was the worst place to be, but also the best aspect to be. Like, it was just weird. And I was like, it's junior college baseball. Junior college baseball. Yeah. 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 It, it's the best experience yeah. you could ever um, get. I, I feel like. I grew up in junior college, just put it that way. <laughs> yeah, exa- yeah, for exactly. sure. I became a, a little bit uh, wiser. And you know what's weird? <laughs> is like when, you get, when you get to Division One, it's like you almost resent the four years that were there, and you're like, you don't understand. Yeah. You have no idea. No like, idea. you're very immature. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's true. I'm not trying to sound that way, but it's true. <laughs> it's true. So... Um, what are the what are the differences in in the vibe of each dugout um, through the different levels? So, college obviously it's a little more you know rah rah. Everyone's mm-hmm. kind of pulling for each other. It, it definitely, especially even 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 junior college, like you're mm-hmm. you're pulling together. Uh, D one aspect, it's definitely like it is about the name on the front. Um, granted, that name on the back's awfully nice too, and you definitely need to play for yourself to, as well. And mm-hmm. baseball is actually a very individual sport. Um, if you individually aren't succeeding, if all the individuals on a team are not succeeding, then the team's not succeeding. Mm-hmm. So you do have to have some sort of selfishness when you play, knowing that if I play well, my team is probably going to, other players around me will play well. Mm-hmm. And then you have to bring in that team aspect as well. So college, it is a, just generally more team. Um, but at the same time within that, you have some of your best players or even that may have a bad attitude at times, good attitude at times, whatever that can affect that. Um, and it can change from game to game at bat to bat, especially high school as well. I think the hardest thing is trying to be the same person through success and failures, whether that's the college level, junior college level, D1 level, whatever, pro level, whatever it is, is trying to be that same teammate when you're having success and when you're having failure. Yeah. And that's really difficult to do. I struggled with that. I, I think everyone struggled yeah. with that. Um, and it's doing your best to when you're failing, not turning into that toxic negative dude. And I, I'll be honest, that was me at times, but at other times I was also very much the guy that it didn't matter what was going on. Mm -hmm. I was a very positive teammate. And so I think that finding that balance for everyone is like where you kind of really need to get to. Um, and as far as teams, the teams that were best at that, that no matter how good or bad we were doing, we'd still kind of rally around each other. Those are the teams that won. Those are the teams that even if we didn't win as many games as maybe the year before, we were more resilient and we'd actually go further into the playoffs with a worse record. So it was kind of, I mean, that that would be the best way I could describe it in a, in a short now, did you, uh, amount of time. Did you change from team to team? Like, obviously, you you are you, right? Mm-hmm. But like your role, personality, um, like, did it change from team to team? and adapt to the team as I got older. Yes. Um, when I was younger, it was more, you were just trying to fit in and, yeah. and it, you never really wanted to develop a clickiness in the clubhouse. And that always happens. Always. I, th- I don't think tough. you can avoid that. Yeah. No. And I think that's just human nature. Yeah. Cause you're going to have um, your little tribes inside of yep. your little community. Exactly. And then like, so, obviously when another team comes in, then your whole team rallies together. But then like, it's weird. <laughs> you have like, these little tribes. And then when someone attacks one of your friends, you're like, Whoa, bro. You can't do that. <laughs> you know, it's definitely, definitely like that. Um, especially minor leagues where it is your team, but you're only getting moved up based on how well you do, not right. how well the team does. Um, <clears throat> partly if the team's doing well and you're part of that reason, yeah, the better teams I play in the minors, the more of those guys got moved up. Um, the worst teams I play in the minors, the less of those guys made it. And it sometimes wasn't a talent thing as much as it was, are you doing well as a, you know, are, is your team winning? When the team won, usually other players were doing well. Um, so I didn't try to – I tried to just fit in, kind of be a little bit of a chameleon at times. As Are you talking I about got, in pro ball? In pro ball, yes. College too. I mean, college is still very much – the end goal is not just, okay, I'm going to get my degree and graduate. For most guys, I go to a high D1 mm-hmm. that I did. Uh, most guys, when they go there, even if they're not very good uh, – I mean, we had a couple of sidearm walk-ons throwing 78 – and these guys are getting drafted by their senior year, making it to high A, double A, way further than they ever should have gone. But you never know. I mean, mm-hmm. a couple other things go right for this kid. Maybe they get a cup of coffee in the yeah. major leagues. So, I mean, the end goal was always base major leagues for me, and, and whatever happened, happened. 
But even in college, you had to find a way to fit in. You had to find a way to, okay, this is kind of the culture. Let me somewhat. You're trying to find your spot. Yeah. Because the culture's already established. Let's let's already fit in. Exactly. So it may change from class to class. It may change from injury to injury. It could, it at any point can change. And it's just always trying to find a way to get it back to where it was. And you already knew where that was going into the season Mm -hmm. and not allowing everyone to just kind of fall down that hill. Um, it's literally you're climbing, you're constantly climbing a hill. And if you just, instead of taking five steps back, let's just take two. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of how the culture worked. It was, we always knew we were always going to at some point become negative. How can we mm-hmm. stop that and get back to where we were? Um, That's what I find interesting with the difference between college baseball and professional baseball is that the college coach is there for a, a while, right? But I mean, in the minor leagues, you could have a different manager almost Every, every year. Di- every different year. Yeah. And it feels like it's like a clean slate for the culture. And it's almost like you look to the vets. The vets are like the people that establish the culture. Yeah. I mean, I had, shoot, at least, I think going into 2018, I'd already been in 18 different clubhouses just professionally. And then there was another two or three that year, two that year with uh, big leagues in AAA. And then the next year in AAA. So what is it? Nine, nine, was that 20 ish, 21, whatever it is. Um, so at that point, like, yes, the managers and coaches do, and definitely a more positive coach who allows you to just kind of play mm-hmm. and, and just go, just go, <laughs> yeah. just show up, play hard, work hard. Um, those guys usually had more successful teams. Um, we've had, I had plenty of teams as well where screw that guy Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> was kind of, but that was also our way of kind of banding together was. Let's play for each other. Let's play for ourselves and each other and screw him. Let's prove him wrong. Yeah. And in some cases, you have to take that approach where it's this coach is super negative telling you how bad you are at the time. Just prove him wrong. Yeah. So then the, lead, the leader, the leaders end up stepping up and then you end yeah. up going to that just, person. Just prove him wrong. Um, and sometimes with those coaches, that is their way of coaching. It, and, and that's, I think, really hard for young kids to understand. When you have a really negative coach who's constantly on you, he probably actually does really care. Mm-hmm. There's probably something that happened in his life that has made him that way. Who knows? But with those coaches I had, I look back and some of them were actually my favorite coaches yeah. because I learned to just count on myself and like the dudes around me rather than having to look to him every time to be like, what did I do wrong? Mm-hmm. Am, am I doing it all right? When you knew like if you had that attitude, you had no chance with that coach because he just eats you up. Yeah. So that's where – you can find ways with a negative atmosphere to turn it positive Mm -hmm. to where you just find a way to band around each other in a positive way around some negativity. And I saw a lot of players with bad coaches actually get better because they had to grow up. They couldn't just be Mm common. And so I thought that was a kind of really cool aspect I learned was in negative atmospheres, seeing players actually kind of blossom because they're able to, trust themselves and only depend on themselves in that other group of guys around them that they can depend on. It's almost like it's, I hate to say it. Sound as bad as it sounds. As bad as it sounds. <laughs> it actually is a blessing in disguise because then if you think about it, if you're trying to climb the professional ladder, you're going to run into, you're going to run into some coaches. dudes. Yeah. Oh, but then sure. also like you move, say you move up to triple a and that coach is in double a. Well now you don't have to worry about it. Like but that you know, coach may follow you. As oh well, really where i've had a manager in high a then you have the same manager in double a and the same manager in triple a oh and then the next year he's your catching coordinator yep and i'm not saying you know i'm just using an example yeah, yeah, right yeah. now so i mean at some point you have to get used to being around something you dislike and being able to still work you become it's, self-reliant mm-hmm. and i think and that's <clears throat> i don't think being self-reliant is selfish by any means no if anything i think it if you can become self-reliant you can then help others become self-reliant and then now you have a team. As you as you um as you climb that ladder, you know low A, high A, double A, triple A, getting into the majors. How much did the culture change? Because you're getting never so closer to that big contract, you know. And everybody, no matter who you are, you're you're thinking about that in the back of your mind, right? I mean, I didn't play professionally, so I don't know firsthand. But was the, were the cultures different or yeah, did that, it yeah shift? that third layer with like money and. Mm-hmm. It was agents. And yeah, you definitely. Uh, I was signed. I'll, I'll say it. I signed for five thousand dollars in the sixteenth round as a twenty-three year old. Every, pretty much every catcher I played with was, if they weren't a higher draft pick, they at least signed for more money. Mm-hmm. So that was always in the back of your head, and you also knew that the management paid attention to that. 
Um, so well, everything's culture, out in the open too, yeah, right? Like, so every, knows. everyone knows yeah. everyone's salary. Everyone, everyone knew, and when that's why I find sign, so everyone's crazy. Everyone's talking about. Yeah, it. you know, it's just like a high, your where, bonus, where you baby. To? Yeah. Where well, you, to, well, you even know? like yeah. even like the big leagues. Like, if you think about it, like, oh, that guy that I'm facing right yeah, now just can, signed a ten million dollar contract. Yeah. yeah. Or I'm trying to crack the lineup, and that guy not just signed a three year extension. Mm-hmm. It in the minors, it's definitely there, but you still once. Maybe in the clubhouse it can get at times a little chippy and when it comes to that stuff. But at the end of the day, we all knew when we stepped on the field, like we were A, a team. And our coaches actually did a very good job with telling us, like, all the teams I played on that did well, that's where the most of us made it, to the big leagues. The guys that, the teams that didn't do well, the le- that lesser amount of guys made it. And we we're like, well, what about, we'd ask coaches, what about, you know, did, were there people who you thought weren't supposed to make it who did because they're on a better team in the minors? Yes. So we were able, even when you knew you're competing for some of the same spots, well, if I don't get called up with you, um, there's 29 other teams. Mm-hmm. There's 20 other teams watching every game. So you were able to find a way to still bind around each other to play well, knowing, well, so what? If you get the chance over me, I might get the chance with someone else, or you may get hurt in a year, and now it's my chance. And so that was kind of the attitude you had to try and have and I had a decent amount of coaches that that's what they preached. And so that was able to transfer over in the clubhouse was, hey, at the end of the day, we all have the same goal. Let's all make each other better. Let's help each other out. Because if, yeah, sure, selfishly, I don't want you to make it at this facility because I want to make mm-hmm. it. But there's 29 other teams. And just because you make it this year doesn't mean I can't be the guy next year. Yeah, and I, I think that's such week. a good aspect. Like, I think that's the professionalism aspect of it. That you, yeah. they, that at the end of the day, you are a professional, right? And I mean, that's the maturity level that you have. And I mean, deep down, you understand that a good clubhouse culture is going to make everyone play better. If everyone plays better, everyone gets more opportunities. Exactly. That's the same so. thing with high school baseball. I mean, if you play well, you're going to get more looks and get more more people around you. And if you put on a show, like we were talking to Evan Pratt last. Mm-hmm. Uh, last episode and he's like man if, if they're playing really well and i enjoy watching them i'm gonna go back and watch that team like I, i'm going to over and over yeah i've seen it a million times at any of those tournaments it's that team that's loud that's energetic that's just putting like on a fun. show yeah, that even in, fun. even in and out and or ground balls in between innings they're joking around throwing the ball around like like looking really good i mean those are the guys if you look behind the stands that's where all the college coaches are because at the end of the day we're all fans of the game right so we want to see the game played really well and I'd we'll, agree. we'll be willing to go watch watch it. Like mm-hmm. my dad is sixty nine years old and he still loves mm-hmm. watching baseball. He'll yep. just come out and watch high school baseball just because. And if it's a and if one of our teams isn't doing well, he's like, I'm gonna go to another game. Mm-hmm. So and it's and that's how college coaches are. I want to see good baseball. If you can show me good baseball, I'll stick around. Yeah, I mean, and it was and to answer your question a little bit more with like, the, did it change? Like, yeah, every big league chain, every big league team had a different culture. But then the day, no matter how much a guy was making or how little a guy was making, like our butts are on TV being analyzed and overanalyzed by everyone. So like your butt's on the line. And so when you're when your reputation's on the line, when you're everything you've put into that work as a young kid's on the line, even if there's a bad culture in the clubhouse, you still gotta show up. Yeah. And so and I think when guys learn how to just show up and play hard, that culture changes. Yeah. And it gets better, even on an, in a in a bad environment. Um, but the winning environments, like they showed up every day, like expecting to win the losing environment showed up every day, expecting to lose. And sometimes it's that simple, uh, whether it's an old veteran guy or a young guy, I, it depends. But the guys that showed up and worked hard, you saw more guys show up and work hard. And so I, I sometimes think the culture is not so much, is it a, are you who, you know, rah, rah, are you this or that? If other people see someone working hard, I think more people are willing to work hard with them. Next thing you know, you have two people working hard and they like each other. Even if they can't stand each other, I respect him. He's working hard. And now you get three, four guys, five, six guys, seven, eight guys doing that. And I think that's where that culture, even in the big leagues, came from was everyone was making so – some of these guys were making so much money. But they were some of the – I mean, some of them were the absolute hardest workers that you're like, I'll do whatever he says mm-hmm. just because you saw how hard he worked. Mm-hmm. So – you know, to go back to your question real quick, it was that's kind of how it goes in my mind. Does the pressure get more when you're knocking on the door of the big leagues? Like you're at AAA or AA and you know, hey, I'm one step away, one move away, and I'm now getting paid, I don't know what the, st- the, the prorated pay is, but, I mean, you're making close to a half mil, over a half mil. 
yeah right away so like does the pressure surmount even more because of that dollar value yes um especially when you're a low draft pick and not saying you're playing for the money but at at the same time, uh, you're now a, a grown man mm -hmm. who has responsibilities. You may or may not have a wife. You may or may not have a child. You have responsibilities where that money becomes very important, especially as a ball player where you know you can't play the rest of your life. Well, you see um, all your boys like going out and having fun, and they're not playing baseball anymore, and you're like, oh, crap. Like, Dude, I'm getting paid this much, and they're, they're already make, making this much money, and I can't. Like, mm -hmm. They're asking me to go to, like, I don't know, Puerto Rico or... In like Europe. Europe. Yeah. yeah. And you can't um, make that trip. You can't. I mean, shoot, well, you're playing eight months a year for one. For two, in AAA, I, I was, you know, making six, seven hundred dollars every two weeks after taxes, maybe eight hundred in AAA. I mean, <laughs> so, you know, that's in your head is you're you're pretty much poor mm -hmm. um, at 26 years old. You know what I mean? Yeah. Most people's careers are starting to get going. So yeah, that's definitely there and you feel that pressure and you definitely know like this is probably my chance. Like I need to perform. And I think that's where it's just do or die at that point. And even if you don't do as well as you think you can or those stats aren't quite there, sometimes they're not looking at, are, are you hitting 300? How many times are you barreling up the ball? Are you hitting the ball hard? Are you having good at bats? Are you taking your walks? When you do strike out, is it was is it because you battled or you just watched three pitches go by mm -hmm. uh, behind the plate? Are you working hard? Do your pitchers like you? There's so many variables. Mm -hmm. So even when you're not having success in that one area, well, there's 10 others you can, uh, whether it's being a good teammate, whether it's practicing hard, whether it's the coaches like, whatever it is, mm -hmm. there's so many other options. So you would try to deflect that pressure to a different area if you were doing poorly. You're like, all right, well, yeah, well, look at all the other things I'm doing well. Um, but you feel that pressure a hundred percent, um, just like you would trying to make a high school team. Yeah. I think it's the same pressure and you just, as an adult, it's no different sophomore playing varsity in high school for myself. There's pressure every day to mm -hmm. show up and play. I wanted to prove everyone right that a sophomore can be on this varsity team mm -hmm. and start and do well. And that pressure doesn't change. You're just older. It's the same pressure. You're just older, more mature, maybe have a couple more responsibilities. So I think if kids can find a way that even as a 12 year old, that same pressure to win that tournament or that same pressure to have a good at bats, have a good attitude with, and worried maybe your dad's mm -hmm. gonna get upset or something is the same pressure I had in the big leagues. It's just, there was a little bit more of it, but now you're an adult. So that pressure really shouldn't change too much because now you're old enough to handle things a little differently. So when you made your debut, did it feel like when your family came to see you, did it feel like just a normal day, like youth baseball? Like it was in like some regards, it did because you know at the end of the day, you're just showing up to the field and you're yeah, like, yeah. if if my name gets called, I got to be ready. So you really do, but at the same time, yeah, you have everything going on mm -hmm. in your head. Um, for me, the debuts weren't. Uh, I mean, trust me, they were very, very special and amazing. But I knew I wasn't going to play very much. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was like, okay, this is just really, really cool, and I get to watch you know really good baseball. I might get a handful at bats. Um, so for me, when things got very interesting, as far as okay, like this is it, was in 2017 with the Blue Jays where I wasn't just there to catch a game or two and have maybe 10 at-bats in six weeks. Like, hey, you're the guy back there. We're running you out there every day. This is your chance, <laughs> you know, and first first series was the Yankees. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> playing the New York I'm Yankees. Facing yeah. Tanaka and, and, you know, <laughs> like I've got Judge, rookie year. I've got all these dudes I got to try and help get you know, out. Get yeah. out. <laughs> And so that's when. So how do you they, strike did out you, Aaron did Judge? You just yeah. like, look at Judge and be like, "What's oh, up, bro?" I mean, literally, you're just like, and a lot of these guys you play in AAA in the minor leagues, so you've grown you've already up, seen them, kind yeah. of grown up with them. Yeah. But now, you know, there's forty thousand people watching, yeah. and if you mess up, you're on ESPN's bloopers. You know what I mean? Yeah. So um, <laughs> it just that's when things kind of changed for me. Was okay, this is what I expected the big leagues to be, um, rather than just this is really cool. Yeah. Um, and don't get me wrong, like it was awesome as a younger guy, but you're there five weeks, you get eight at bats, you're playing once a week, maybe. Yeah. It's just different. It's like getting called up to varsity and knowing you're just going to watch. It's cool, but it's once you're playing on varsity in high school, then you're like, yeah, this is, this is it. So that it kind of took two years for me to like fully get that in my mind, the big league experience. How important do you think the manager is to a team? I know we talked about, um, the players start rallying and, spiting the coach and then you guys end up winning and it's not 
on the hat of him. Yeah. It's on the hat of you guys that end up doing that. Uh, do you think that the manager plays an integral role inside of a team? I think every manager does. Um, I think, obviously, their character, their their personality, everyone's different. And, and I think sometimes it's where players have to take a responsibility to somewhat mold within that manager, and I think managers have to take a responsibility to somewhat mold around their team. I don't think it can always be so cookie cutter. Um, I mean, even youth sports – Every year, even the same team, kids change. Their attitudes Mm -hmm. change. 11-year-old kid one year may not be the same exact kid he is when he's 12, 13, 14, 15, even mentally. And even a coach, his life could change drastically in that year. So I think the big things with managers that affect it is, are they capable of molding around the guys they have every year? And I think that's what makes the difference is if the manager's willing to not necessarily change, but like, you know, I can, all right, I have this select guys this year. How can I bring them together is where I think it gets important. It's, it's no different than just laying out some dough and having different shaped, you know, cookies that you're mm-hmm. going to make. Each thing's different. And so I think that's the, those managers are the really good ones is that they're able to, I have 25 guys. They're different than the 25 guys I had last year. Let me kind of mold around them so they can mold around me in a sense, if, if that makes sense and, and go. Yeah. And I think that's when teams have success. And I think sometimes when the manager's a little less hands-on, he's more just the guy watching Mm -hmm. and saying a little less is when teams respond better because when that manager does speak up, everyone listens. Yeah, it's choosing your words. Very wisely. Yes. It's kind of like, I don't know, do you watch Seinfeld at all? No. So (laughs) Sorry. so, (laughs) So George Costanza is so mad because people stop paying attention to him. And so Jerry says, well, you're not, you're not leaving them for some the reason to do it. Yeah. yeah. They'll have that wanting more. <clears throat> He's like, what do you mean? He's like, well, whenever I do a comedy bit, I always want, I want them, I want the audience so to come do, back, come back. Yeah. So basically the whole episode is around him and he realizes that people are start laughing. He's like, once they start laughing, leave the room. No matter what happens, <laughs> just leave the room. And so he makes the joke and then he's like, he just starts looking around. He's like, I'm done. <laughs> it just leaves. And then he like he ends up getting like promotions and starts getting higher up on the ladder in his job just because he's leaving right when he he should be and then it ends up catch, ca- ca- uh, catching him on the butt or he he should be staying there. He is actually he leaves at the wrong time. Uh, so funny. Anyways, I'm a huge Seinfeld fan. But <laughs> that does remi- that does remind me of the whole hey, choose your words wisely, don't say too much. Leave leave some room for the players wanting more. So totally. to, sorry to, to go back on the manager side of things. And, ma- and this is just a question. Cause you had said something like five minutes ago that I had a question on when you got a negative cl- clubhouse guy, cause they're, they're guys that just have bad attitudes or they're just, you know, maybe they're not personal or whatever. And they're bringing down the clubhouse and maybe from a professional aspect, is that handled more so from the team culture side or is that the skip or the manager or, who who ultimately kind of takes care of that or takes control yeah. of that? And how does that happen? It, how do you so, go about it? I mean, sometimes some people's personality is just their personality. Yeah. Um, what I found was the guys who were negative, if they could find a way to make it funny, then people loved it. Um, the guy, oh, here we go again, and like crack a joke. <laughs> guys loved it because then it brought laughter and joy to people, even though they're like, oh, here's the salty guy again, but let's see what he's got to say. And I think like if that's when negative guys can actually be positive is is like, okay, fine. If you're going to be the negative dude, like make some people laugh then. And on the AAA teams I had, and even bigly, you have a lot of salty vets. Like I was 32, 31 in AAA, surrounded by Austin Riley at 21. You know, guys like that, uh, that you're over 10 years older than them. And you have to find a way to like get along and understand each other. And so sometimes like the salt, me and the couple other like salty vets, like they loved us because even though at times it might've sound negative, we were just trying to make them laugh. And the easiest way to make them laugh would be like, say something negative and then crack a joke. And so I think that's where like negative guys can actually have a positive impact. And I'm not saying I was a negative guy, but just at times like you're going to be negative. You're going to be losing ball games trying to just flip it into like a positive. And I think the managers who did the same thing, um, most managers are 
56 years old. They're probably salty vets. And the ones that could be chippy, negative, and funny at the same time, like, we loved them because that's what we, we actually expected out of them. But at the same time, we're like, this guy makes us laugh. And so I think that's where coaches who are negative can change the game a little bit is just make your guys laugh, even mm-hmm. if you're negative. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but as far as like where it came down from, I, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I think at times it was just that's just who those people were. If maybe a guy was getting too negative, like, yeah, uh, another vet would pull that guy over and be like, yo, you have to change something. Like, just do your best to work on this practice like anything else. A manager would maybe call them in the office. Hey, this is what's going on, blah, blah, blah. If we had a negative manager we just didn't like, it was yeah. hard. It, you weren't able to really just go tell him <laughs> did a did you ever have like a clubhouse cancer guy who was just brutal like nobody wanted to be around and it just brought down the team yeah i mean i think every team probably has one of those yeah or at least a partial one of those and i think that's where same thing goes if you can just get in that guy's head to be stay yourself if you want to be that guy fine but just find a way to have like some sort of positive impact yeah uh, but most of those guys kind of weed themselves out. Yeah. The teams don't want them, and next thing they you know, exile themselves. Yeah. yeah. So at the, I mean, if a kid's not willing to change or teammates not willing to change at some point, like unless you're that good, they're just going to get rid of you. Yep. Um, so I think if that's one thing kids can take away is, if you are one of those negative people, you better be really damn good. Yep. And if you're not, no one's going to want you. Right. And I think I know I like it feels good to be wanted. So I think that's maybe an aspect people can take is in baseball like i want to be wanted by my team how can i do that yeah no i mean that's a that's a massive takeaway because you you see that all the time and it's kind of like the kid in youth baseball that you know from 7 to 14 years old he's played for 10 different teams yeah he just keeps hopping and hopping and it's never his fault and it's never it's always the coach's fault or the player's fault that he played and it starts at home too oh yeah to be honest i mean that starts at home um i hate it when you see these videos online and the kids are pulling their son out of the game, travel ball game. He's 10, 11 years old in the middle of the game. And I'm like, dude, just wait. Wait till the end of the game to say something to the coach or, hey, coach, like, we need to talk. Don't take your kid off his travel team. We already got another team lined up in the middle of the game. Yeah. And that happens. It's which crazy. Is crazy. It happens all the time. Um, and so the, the kids see that. And then even if they don't want to be that way, well, uh, that's what they see. So then they somewhat start becoming that way. Mm-hmm. And, and so that's a hard cycle to break. And I think that's where – you need to, once they get into high school, hopefully they have a good coach or even just a good teammate who's willing to just talk to them mm-hmm. about it, honestly. Yeah. How do you neutralize the cancer on the team? Um, I think at some point you just have to ignore it. Um, it's no different than if, if you say you're online and you read a bad comment about the, you know, the wrong sires mm-hmm. uh, and you know it's just completely invalid. You just ignore it rather than let it bother you and get in your head, mm-hmm. uh, just as example. So I think at some point it's you got to ignore them and try and talk to them. If they're not willing, um, you kind of just let, leave them be. At some point, it, it's no different than, than animals. If you have a wolf pack, let's say, and you have that one wolf who's kind of out to the side, at some point that wolf's going to want to be a part of the wolf pack. Mm-hmm. And so you can help, you can talk to them. At some point, you just gotta, it's like a kid, just let them learn. And at some point, I feel like that they make that decision. Either I want to be a part of this pack or I don't. And if they do, they're usually willing to at least change a little bit. Mm-hmm. If they don't, they're probably not on the team any longer. Because mm-hmm. management they end up going their it. own way. Yeah. yeah. And they're, you know, back home saying, oh, it was so-and-so's fault. Right. Um, during one of your games last weekend, um, by the way, enjoy – seeing your team play and obviously you and Cody coaching like it's it, we were talking about it. it's mm-hmm. phenomenal thanks um you ended up talking to the other player of the other team and chirping at him which yeah. I thought was great because it kind of took me back to like the old days where like nowadays it seems like no one talks to each other on the field like if oh you you've got yellow and gold and I've got black and orange we're not talking today um, and you end up crossing that line, and I forgot what the conversation. I think it was about batting gloves. Yeah. And the guy had like golden yellow batting yeah. gloves. Like you literally spot it like a mile away. And what what did you what did you end I think up? He was saying? his helmet. He had the wrong helmet on or something. Yeah. Like that. And, and you end up saying said like spray paint it yellow or something. And I, and I found that really interesting because then um, you end up making the comment. He's like, I really love when kids like chirp back at me. Oh yeah. And it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's it was like cool. It's kind of like you're test you're testing it. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, I know a lot of those kids were going to play, especially in the St. Louis area. Like, our players know them. And um, I think sometimes they expect coaches to just kind of stay in their own world and never really interact with them. And I always felt like it was really cool when uh, big league camp, for instance, first spring training, I'm there, the young guy, and having no idea what's going on. Like, just hope I don't stick my butt out the bushes and someone, you know, yeah. get upset at me or something. Yeah. Uh, and when, like, that old vet would just kind of chirp at you, and you'd be like, do I chirp back? Do I just... <laughs> and they're testing you. Yes, and yes sir. Yes, yeah, yes, yes, sometimes sir. <laughs> it'd be like, oh, what was that? You know? And then other times, like, you chirp back, but you had to be careful how you did it. Mm -hmm. And I always like, okay, like that means they're at least interested in me. Yep. And so I think it sometimes just chirping at a kid, whether hopefully they get the, that you're joking with them. Mm -hmm. I think it's good to see that because they have to get used to that. They're going to have to get used to veteran players in college, in high school, given the hard time. Yeah. And in most cases, the people who handle that well become well liked by yep. their team. And I think that's like, can sometimes actually create a really good culture is, and you weren't being a dick about it. It was no. just more of you wanted to, make light of the situation yep. that was happening. Yeah. His coach was giving him a hard time. Yeah. And, and the coach was, and, it, and the coach was having a fun time as well. Yep. And you read the situation, right. And then, and then the kid read it, read yeah. it like he uh, was awesome. He just, yeah. he rolled right through it and it was, it was good. Yeah. Was really I just, good. sometimes I, I think just talk to them like you would anyone else. And for me, sometimes that's chirping at them. Yeah. I don't think kids expect it. And I think they grow to like it because then they're like, Oh, I can like, you know, me, me and my coach can go back and forth so I can give, I mean, you probably saw, I give my players a hard time, yeah. but it's usually very loving in a sense or a joke. And then I go into a teaching moment. Well, I think it's just the world right now is just so serious. Yeah. Everyone's like it's offended very, by it, everything. Yeah. Everyone's offended you by know? everything. It's very serious. And then when you're able to make a joke or light of a situation inside of a serious moment, it really makes the, makes the, makes the game a lot better. Um, I, we always had a manager. He's like, Hey, I love having fun, but we got to get the job done. We're going to have fun, but we got to get the job done. And we're going to, we're going to do some certain things inside of, um, the game. And I expect you guys to perform, but I'm going to, I'm going to chirp at you. Yeah. I think it's, if it's done correctly, I think it's a very fun thing to do. And I think you guys are adults, you're grown men. Like mm -hmm. we all do that as mm -hmm. we, as we get older and we do it with our significant others. We do it with, our friends, like it's just a part of life, and mm -hmm. I think people who can handle that better are usually probably going to be more successful. I in agree. Life. And so, in my mind, it's like, why not chirp at the kid in high school, hoping that when he gets chirped at for real in life, that he can have a little chip on his shoulder and handle it correctly. Mm -hmm. Whether it's a joke, whether even if he's never going to talk to that person again, or he gets to college and the guys chirping at him, and he can give a little chirp back and move on. I think those are the people that can kind of roll with the bumps, roll with the punches, whatever you want to say, mm -hmm. rather than, did you hear what that guy said to me? Like, he's giving a hard time, and now he's domed up, and is it bad? And it's like, well, now you're just a softie. You know I mean? <laughs> well, if you're so, going to Ole Miss thinking that's going to be sh sunshine and rainbows, you've got something else no, coming. No, it's, it's not. Especially in the big leagues. I can only imagine what the chirping's like in the big it's leagues. It's terrible. Some of the things these fans say is... I don't even go to Bailey games just because sometimes cause, it's, it's that cause I get angry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what 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 fans have been really really good to you? Uh, good. Tor Toronto was decent. I had one moment I I I messed up, but for the most part they were pretty good to me. Uh, Cubs fans were always pretty good. Reds didn't know who the heck I was. <laughs> um, <laughs> Padres were very good to me. Yeah, the fans they they liked me a lot and um, uh, yeah, I mean it was usually a pretty good experience with the home clubs unless you like really messed up and then they'd get over it after a week if you messed up um away teams though they wouldn't hold back <laughs> they're definitely um but like, you know what that's kind of part of their job you know what i mean like you're cheering for your team and you're going to do anything you want for your team to win whether it's right or wrong yep. as a fan and i think it actually drives me insane you know turning on uh, watching sports the past two years has been very difficult for me mm -hmm. with the, all the kind of cancel culture going on and yeah I, I don't want to go there with this, but it's tough because at the same time, it's like, you know what? You, they're here to watch you play. Stop making it about you know, get that fan kicked out of the game. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You just show up and play. Ignore them. What, no matter what they're saying, it's no different than that's their job is to try and get in your head yeah. so that their team can win. And your job and, is to entertain. And your job is, is to entertain. Your job is, I mean, it's show business. Baseball is a, is a show. They call mm -hmm. it, the, what, I mean, 
well, greatest show on turf for a while was mm-hmm. the name for one of the, one of the teams. It, it, it's it's a show. That's mm-hmm. why we call the game the show. So I hate when you see these players get so sensitive with what, yeah, sometimes what fans say is not very nice. You give them a little one-liner back, move on. Yeah, They're trying to make you lose. Mm-hmm. They don't want you to win. And mm-hmm. I hate this whole, we got to speak out about everything kind of thing. <laughs> it's just, they're trying to do that. They're yep. trying yeah. to get yep. your head to take your focus off the game. Yep. So that they're, that their team is able, that their that, team's able to win. Well, yeah. it's no, it's no different than what we hear those stories all the time of like, well, that other dugout's just they're loud, they're rowdy, yeah, they're they're, they're yelling at us, they're doing this. I'm like, well, yeah, they well, don't. What want do you want? What do you want? This what is, do you yeah. think they're trying to do? This is, well, base, this is baseball. yeah, but they're mean. <laughs> like, well, they can't say that to that. They can't say that to my son. Well. You're gonna it's going to get worse. I just think back like at the mid- medieval days or something like that. Like mm. if you said that, <laughs> that guy's being really mean to me. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, that's my, I mean. You take your bread. <laughs> I, I, I kind of like when, whenever, a, you know, whether it be a parent or a player or someone comes up and says that, I'm like, well, wh- I'm sorry, but what would you like me to do? You beat them and they'll shut up. Yeah. No, I mean, without a that, that's, that's a fact. The number, my second answer is it's going to get worse as you play this game longer. Mm-hmm. If you make more mistakes, it's going to get louder and louder and louder. And some kids can't handle that. Yeah. Just imagine going into Texas A&M if you're a pitcher. Oh, you I mean, walk that one, that one ball had like five. How many? How many? Ball how, many six. how many? How many 12, balls did he that guy throw? It was oh twelve. So. Oh my gosh! Good for him though. He was t- he just kept on going up there and just started throwing. At just- that point, my next pitch is going up to the uh, backstop, and I'm like, ball thirteen. <laughs> I'm going to call it on myself. <laughs> Sometimes that's the way. <laughs> you just make fun of yourself, and they have nothing to make fun of. There are some teams that um, have fantastic cultures. Like when you first start out, there's just some unbelievable cultures when you go, and then just for whatever reason, they hit a bump on the road. They're, they they might not be as talented as they thought, or they're playing a schedule that's a little bit tougher than um, what the management thought that they were putting them in. How do you stop like a culture flipping? into a derailment um it's tough 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 one uh well have you have you been yeah have you been in those situations where like man i love every dude on this squad like this is awesome (laughs) but we're losing like 10 games in a row yeah Uh, i mean part of baseball is you're gonna have your hot streaks your cold streaks um i think it's like any other behavior we all have is just trying to find a way to snip it in the butt uh whether you're that kid who is high school and you're, you know, starting off with great grades the first part of the semester. And then at the end, you always kind of teeter out. Mm -hmm. Um, Had a conversation with one of our guys. He's like, oh, you know, I didn't really try in my finals. I I have straight A's. And I remember having a conversation and being like, no, no, get in the habit of like finishing. Like, it's not just about how you start, it's how you finish. And at most cases, people are looking at how you finish, not how you start, Mm -hmm. whether you have four point or not. So try and explain to me, like, get in that good habit now. So you don't fall into that bad habit later. Mm-hmm. I think it's the same way with cultures is getting that good habit, no matter how bad things are going to just snip that bad attitude, snip that negative thought, snip that whatever it is as quickly as possible and just keep showing up. I think a big thing is not changing what you're doing unless it's obviously you're doing the wrong thing all the time, but continue to show up to the field, prepare, continue to show up to the field, expecting to do well. So much of this game is mental with the amount of failure. I mm-hmm. mean, it's it's crazy to think. I always word to my players when they get upset after one swing, one out. I'm, I'm always like, dude, this is the only place you can come home with a 30% on your test. And your parents are like, good job. <laughs> <laughs> True. You know what I mean? Like, imagine as a kid, like, I could go to my science exam and get a 30 and, and be, a good job. be praised for it. And so that's really hard thing. And I think you have to remind yourself at how hard this game is. And how even if you hit the ball hard 10 times, you still might get three hits. Um, you could get seven, but you're most likely not because there's eight, eight, nine guys out there. Um, eight, I don't include the catcher necessarily being out there. But um, So I think it's really just trying to snip that in the butt as quick as possible and still just show up, do your work, expect to win. And I think good things happen. Um, and there's times it's just it's, an, it's just not going to happen. You know what I mean? There's, there's teams that find ways to win. And I, I think that's a big thing, too, is finding a way to win, whatever it is. Just do whatever it takes to win that game, mm-hmm. win that at bat, win that strike, uh, whatever, mm-hmm. win that pitch, whatever it is. Um, I do th- I do think I know a lot of youth baseball is, I know even here, we, we talk about development over anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm a firm believer that a part of development is winning. Um, I agree. And, and the reason I say that is, 
especially teaching youth kids is like you, I try and teach these kids how to, 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 to develop. But part of that, like I said, is winning is teaching them how to win. Um, yeah, that is a skill set to, to win is a, is a skill set. People don't realize, Oh, well, all you care about is winning. No, no. But I'm be honest too, is part of your success is winning Mm -hmm. (laughs) life. You name it, job, whatever it is. It's execution. Like how do you know how to execute? I, I always love it for the first week or second week, everyone is like all on board. We're all in. Right. Mm-hmm. And then when you get to like week three, week four, day 58, that's when you really know like who are the winners in the situation. And it, you have to be taught how to do that. Like, I mean, we've all been there. Like we've had certain coaches that have taught us how to actually win. It could have been a dad. It could have been a coach. Um, could have been a teacher, but at some point they teach you how to actually compete and finish the job. Yeah, totally. And I think that's where you just, to answer your question, is where it comes from is do people know how to A, execute or B, win? And I think that's where that development gets really cool in players is you can teach them how to field. You can teach them all these different things, which is a big part of development. Mm -hmm. But when you can teach any person how to win, and I hate to sound that way, like they usually become successful. Yeah, that's true. Successful. And they usually become better off the field too it's very addictive and and you want to yeah. i mean every morning you wake up and as an adult you try and in my mind i'm trying to win a ball game that day yeah because for me that's just how i work and it's difficult to think of things differently i'm mm-hmm. so used to going to the field so it's like how can i just like win this little ball game today in whatever it may be i think we're the separating factor for a lot of coaches like really top end like legendary coaches is getting a player to know how to win in a pressure situation Mm -hmm. like when everything is completely against you and you've just got lit up um three runs and you have to go back out there and try to get another out and then hopefully your offense can kick it into high gear and then you can come back out and win the ball game i think that's where like really good coaches cut their teeth is is that situation because it's really tough like when you have a player that misses a ball and then he has a lot of pressure on him and then you try to figure like he doesn't know how to handle it he just breaks down I think that yeah. goes back to like the example you gave about talking to the player about the the last test of the year. You just have to teach yourself to win at everything. You have to take that just as seriously as the first one, and then it becomes just second nature. That's that's the Nick Saban's world. That dude does. That dude will. If you played chess against him, he's going to kick your ass yeah, at it's chess. Competing. It's no. There's no difference. It's he's showing up on time every day. That's a win. He's competing at every single thing he does, and they don't know anything different. They yeah. just they just don't know. So those situations come up. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that I've just messed up three times in a row. I'm going to win this one. It and makes no he might difference. Have not even and had, that's, and he's might have never played chess before. Yeah. And he's like, have you ever played chess? Nope, but I'm going to beat you. Yeah. <laughs> at least try. You yeah, I'm going mean? to at least try. I'm going to try to beat you. Big saying, um, you guys might have heard me this weekend, and a couple of guys on the team are like, Raf, I've never heard people you know, say that before. I'm a big, my little saying is, so what? Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. you were just mentioning, I'll just, they mess up. I go, so what? Like, you'll hear me yell it. They swing at a bad pitch. So what? Mm-hmm. Next pitch. Like, that one's over. Win this next one. Uh, you made a bad pitch. You did whatever. So it, you hit three home runs yesterday. So what? So what? What What are you going to do today? Um, and I think that's where, like you're saying, at some point it has to be somewhat of that attitude because there's always the next minute, next hour, next whatever. You got to do something. Mm-hmm. You got to show up. And I, I highly agree. I mean, mm-hmm. you just – at some point it's – I'm not just – I might be 0 for 9. I still have to try and win this at bat. Mm-hmm. I still have to try and win this. That's pitch. big for double headers. Like double they headers, huge. double headers huge. are like that. Like if you win the first game, it seems like everyone just drops off in the second game. And you're like, so what? You won. <laughs> we still so got what? one. We got one more. Yeah. The other, the other team doesn't care. Yeah. The other team doesn't care. Like, they want to beat you now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're coming off fresh. They just got back from the hotel, and we've been mm-hmm. out here for three hours already. So what? Let's go beat them. That's. The, I think it's a very good attitude, and if you can have that in a. Not in a nonchalant way, but more in a, so what, I'm trying to be victorious this next step, this next whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where it helps develop these kids at a younger age, too. That's that's something, too, that's with, with younger athletes. It, it's kind of like a pride factor. Yeah. And it's it's hard to teach those guys that. But the ones who get it, man, the, that's such an asset that they don't have any clue how Im- important that is. And they become so resilient when they yeah. when they're able to do that and they're able yeah. to unlock that. It's unreal. It, it goes it goes back to like the cancel culture, just like so what, move on, um, and because you're gonna get into situations yeah. that are worse than this one, way like, worse. And, yeah. Oh yeah, like just adult, like just thinking about like just life 
bills. Yeah, everything. I mean, dude. everything. And if you're able to click that, so what? Dude, you, you're unbeatable. Yeah. You you're have a huge unbeatable. leg up on everyone. It's yeah. it's really neat when you see a young kid figure that out and kind of get to that maturity level and just like very early on. Oh yeah, know? and I've seen it. I've seen it at different ages. Uh, you know, I mean, I've seen it with twelve year olds. I've seen it with seventeen year olds. I've seen it with a lot of different guys. And it's if when that when that light bulb clicks, it's like rocket ship up, like Even legit, legit, legitimately yeah. rocket ship up. To it's the moon. crazy. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Your, your favorite phrase. <laughs> to the moon. <laughs> we all knew what it meant. Too. <laughs> this conversation has been awesome. I want to get you back on for the Tiger interview series. I want to get really specific on just just the skill side of things. Um, I think it's just very valuable to hear it from the big leagues, but also hear it from um, a, a journeyman like yourself going from every single level because you rarely have that usually if you're a big leaguer you're either you've played minor league baseball but you didn't play college or you played um four year and you went straight to professional baseball so there's like there's not many guys that can say that they went juco four year different schools Mm -hmm. and then went to um minor leagues and the big leagues um but the last question i have is um it's a culture thing from from a professional level is like why do you think mlb guys are struggling with coming back into the game on the youth baseball side? Because this is what's impressive about you is that you could be, we talked about this off camera, is that you could be pissed off at the world about baseball because you're still not in the big leagues, right? Or you can flip the script and then you're giving back to the game. Because I, I rarely see big league guys in coaching, at even at the youth and even high school level. Um, they're either doing it from a distance because they want to give back to the game, but they're still they're still dealing with some stuff that they don't want to get back into it into it. But there's just a select group of guys that do that. Why do you think that is? So I think it it does depend on how high of a caliber that big league player was. Um, there is a lot that goes into. I think players do get very bitter at the end of their careers, um, whether it's fans or whatever it could be. I mean, some of these guys. I came through the minor leagues with Chris Bryant. We played in the big leagues together, and like this guy can't go to Starbucks without being stopped for two hours. True. So I think sometimes what happens, these guys are like, if I go coach youth baseball, I won't like I literally am going to be in the spotlight again. And now that I'm done, I don't want to be in the spotlight because mm-hmm. you're going to have parents constantly going up to him. Can I get a picture? Can I get an autograph? So they Things get like burnt that. out on it. So I think they get a little burnt out of constantly having to be in the light, and um, I think that's maybe easier with kids. But when the adults get involved, then it gets a little, it gets annoying, um, I, I think, for those players. I, I think the other thing is some of these guys, it, it's because it does become a very much a business that they're maybe scared to lead these kids into this business. Um, I think people don't realize how much of a business it becomes. And, and you do somewhat become cattle where, mm-hmm. you know, you're just, a, you know, you're stock <laughs> mm-hmm. and they're just trading you, selling you as they please. Yeah. And, and I think that's something you just have to accept. Um, that doesn't mean it's necessarily the best way to handle things, but I think you have to accept it. And so I think with major league players coming back, it's partly that, um, it kind of goes back to something we said earlier that I would never know you play in the big leagues. And I love that because I can go to smoothie King. I can go to Starbucks. I might occasionally randomly be like, Hey, did, are you so-and-so And that, but it's very seldom, especially the further away. I so am you from love playing. that. You love that. I love that. No one knows who the heck I am. Uh, that they have to maybe find out from a bio or me, miss someone. Oh, what you know? What have you done in your career as a worker or whatever? Like, oh, how long have you been doing this job? Oh, eight months. What did you do before? Oh, I played major league baseball. Do you love? Do you um, love saying that? Like, <laughs> well, like, it's like, it's like, like, that. It's like Trump a, card. Yeah, <laughs> it's funny. Uh, I, I do. I, I enjoy it. It's not that I'm trying to brag about it by right. any means, but I think it's. But it ends up, it's like when you say it, like I can yeah. only imagine. Because yeah. I, I had a brief little moment there, nothing like yours. Like I, me saying big league, that'd be, that'd be crazy. But this this guy was like, oh, I'm really into baseball. I was like, oh, yeah. He's like, I played high school. I, I actually was on the all-state team. I was yeah. like, oh, that's great. He's like, did you play? And I was like, oh, you shouldn't have asked that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I played at Missouri State and played a little bit of professional baseball. And he's like, man, that really makes me feel bad. I'm like, no, that's not what I wanted it's to not, do. Yeah, by no means. But <laughs> yeah. it's, a, it's, it's such a small group of people who even just go play college. I mean, it's like 7% of high school players go on to play college yeah. at any level. 1% of that go and play professional ball. Uh, a s- even smaller percent of that make it to the big leagues. Yeah. So I think like if you were to look it up, I'm like number 18,100 whatever. That was 
in 2014. So, I mean, we're only here six, seven years later. That number is still probably under 20,000. Like, if you think about it, that doesn't fill half a Bush Stadium of all the big leaders ever. So, I mean, it is a cool thing to say, and I yeah. think it's something people should be proud of if they can do it. And I, I enjoy it because I, my next thing is, yeah, you thought I'd be a little bigger, huh? Yeah. And, and so I love actually teaching small kids that are good um, the, that small 11 year old who's, you're like, that's a good player. Yeah. And I'm like, just, just wait, you'll grow, mm-hmm. keep working hard. Like don't get down. And so you, div- you open up this whole other chain to all the little kids who are like, they're not six feet at 12 years old. They're not five, eight at 12 years old. They're four eleven, who are really good ball players. And now they might've quit because they got sick of it. Or maybe they don't continue to develop because like, I'm not as good as these guys, or maybe they're not on the top team because they're smaller. So now you open up this whole little, you can unlock a little more out of them because they're like, oh, like this little dude playing the big leagues? And then you go, sh- I show him. I'll be yeah. like, hey, this is me hitting a home run in Fenway. Yeah. That's you? Yeah. Yeah. I'm 5'8", man. Yeah, you can do like, it too. You can yeah. do it too. So it's really cool to sometimes, and even the small kids where I'll get, or the big kids, hey, you're tall at 12. Like we had the 14-year-old commit to Mizzou. Yeah. I said, Congra- walked up to him, hardly met him maybe once or twice. I said, congratulations, that's awesome doesn't mean a thing yeah because if you get complacent and stop working that little dude on your team who's really talented he's gonna outplay you Mm -hmm. next thing you know you're a senior out of the game and he's the one taking your spot so then you can unlock a little more out of them they're like oh like yeah that is a big deal but you know what i still have five more years to play before i go to college (laughs) right so like i like using that aspect at times with parents to maybe unlock a little more out of kids yeah. just from a mental side. I also think a lot of people don't understand like the purity of the game is really at that youth level. It like, is. It, that's where it's the best. I, I was, I was at a camps this morning. Um, we, we run camps on our balls and strikes brand and it was very refreshing to get back out there. And literally you have like people make fun of this. You had kids playing in the dirt, but then you'll have this other kid that's like talking trash to the other kid. And then there's these two, these, these three great kids over here, like just grouping up. And then all of a sudden the ball's hit and then everyone's back into, back into the game. Like that's what baseball is about. It's a sandlot. Like that's what I love talking about with coach ball game mm-hmm. is he, it's that pure aspect of it. And then if you can play a little bit of the big leagues or you can play uh, college baseball or even continue your career in high school. Great. That's another, it's yeah. another layer on top of your career, but understand like this game's all, all about fun, man. It is. You got to find a way. I mean, when it gets bitter, it gets tough. And when it, I think, I think that's what happens is most guys aren't good at the end of their career or as good. So they get bitter and, and they're like, and, and then they get traded, they get whatever. And then, so now the last thing you want to do is coach baseball. And I was, I told you earlier, I was one of those guys like, I never would have thought I'd be coaching baseball. In fact, it was like a goal of mine not to. <laughs> um, <laughs> now look like, at you. <laughs> and here I am, you know. Um, but I, I guess at one point it was, and even my wife's like, you know what, this might be good for you. Like this might like bring some healing to you as far as baseball went. Um, because I ended with an injury. I had some bad things happen within baseball. Some and, bad and breaks and stuff. Bad breaks, yeah. You know, like as fortunate as I was, it was also very unlucky at times. And she was like, just just do it. Mm-hmm. Like it, it may... It, you may it may bring joy back to you with baseball yeah and it has and that's what's been really cool is that and maybe i think more guys should just give it a try Mm -hmm. and and, you know the parents are the parents and if what i've learned is if you just have a good influence on the kid the parents are going to shut up yeah or they'll just sit there and be like i am overjoyed i'm spending this money to take my kid to you yeah maybe not even sometimes so much for the lesson as it is, is like, I just want my kid to be around you. Yeah. Because usually if you're around successful people, you breed more successful people. And so I think sometimes these kids, like even they don't know who I am, they don't know, they know I might've played in the big leagues, they'll bring their kid to me just because they want their kid to be around someone who's made it. Yeah. And I don't think youth kids, they only see those guys on TV. They don't ever see them live in person. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's even better when it's someone who's not 6'5", who can relate to them and so I think that's, I'm glad I came back to the coaching youth. A, there's benefits to it. I can be at home. I don't have to travel eight months a year. If there's one thing I do not miss with playing or even I got offered to coach with the Blue Jays and I said, no, um, I didn't want to travel. Yeah. And so it's, to me, it's like, I can stay in baseball, be 10 minutes from my house and have probably a lasting influence on most of these kids, whether they play professionally or not. We can already see like kids gravitate towards you. Oh yeah. Like so it's, I mean, it's fun. Yeah. Like, 
it's enjoyable again. Even my father last night's like, you sound really happy. And I'm like, yeah, it's, it's like, I, I feel like I have as weird as this may sound and I'm not trying to be weird by any means, but told my dad the other day, I was like, yeah, I feel like I have like a hundred different sons yeah. that I can just like That's help cool. out once, twice a week and maybe make a difference in their life. Yeah. Well, it um, feels like it's a, whenever you're in here, it feels like a clubhouse. That's what it feels like. Like you're giving him shit the other day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I want my undefeated bonus. You know? We're 4-0. <laughs> well, Rafi, this has been an unbelievable conversation. Um, I mean, every single time it seems like I'm learning something from you. Um, and I feel like I'm back into a college clubhouse or a professional clubhouse, which is always fun. I do, I do miss those little relationships. It wasn't even the game. It was like just... That's what you remember. Yeah, that's what I miss. That's what you remember. <laughs> it really, it really is. Bus like rides, playing yeah. cards, things like that. Yeah. yeah, like and then coming up with these stories, like you can't believe, like we did this mm-hmm. and stuff like that. So, um, guys, uh, oh, we have a closing pitch. Just, mm-hmm. Jesus you keep forgetting <laughs> it every time. You know, we should just consolidate all of the podcasts into one, so then we just know, like, okay, this is our intro, this is our outro. Um, I'm just not being a great podcast host. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> I think it's been great. <laughs> Uh, closing pitches, Dave, go ahead and, um, hit it off. Yeah. Real quick. I'll come back, come in and then Rafi can close it out. Yeah. Real quick. Um, again, there, there's always a special takeaway from every podcast we do, but uh, obviously this one was k- kind of tailored more towards the clubhouse side, the culture side. And obviously you have just an unreal amount of experience with so many different levels of, you know, culture and clubhouse and players and coaches that most people just honestly never get to to get that experience they never get to see those things so i i hope the listeners today will take a little bit of tidbits away from those examples that you presented in the and the different pieces of advice you give i mean just sitting out on that field for five hours listening to you talk to the kids and the insight that you're bringing to them and the, the, the those little nuggets that you just like to interject those things you don't don't undervalue those people those those are the things that as you add those up will make a world of difference in your playing ability, your game, your experience, the overall outlook that you have on the sport. So take those things, run with it, apply it, listen, because they're, they're super valuable. Um, big thing is just the purity of the game. And obviously when you want to take it serious and move on to the next level, you've got to do some certain things, right? Um, but being able to, enjoy the game and being out there that's what it's all about like if you end up going out there and just bitter it just is not fun and i would recommend that you stop playing the game um but big thing from today overall um has been just the experience side of things like kind of just going off of what Mm -hmm. dave said like um being that journeyman and then obviously providing some insight that was huge um so i really enjoyed the conversation um Go ahead and close it out. What's, what's, what's the big takeaway from this uh, convo? Yeah, I just think, um, I know for me, it's it's you, you got to try and make it fun. Um, I think winning is very important, obviously. I think it develops, and, and part of winning is having fun and vice versa. Um, but try and make, I think as coaches, we need to find try and find a way to parents as well. When we, something negative happens in a kid's life, that doesn't mean you have to be unicorns and rainbows all the time. Find a way to still make it a positive experience, though. Mm-hmm. You can still be some of my guys. I'll get stern with them and and chirp right back at them. But then that next pitch, I'm like, that a boy. Like that's how it's done. Mm-hmm. So f- try and find a way. If you are gonna have to harp on a kid, is just do it the right way. Don't bury him. Whenever you bury these kids mentally, they just go into a shell. Even big leaguers, they just go into a shell, and it's really hard to get them out of it. And, or and if they do, they're not the same. Um, they kind of get shell shock in a sense. So I think one thing I've learned a lot just coaching these kids is how if you just talk to them, if they were an adult and you're just like literally just talk to them, don't belittle them, don't talk down to them, talk with them. Mm. And I think that's where you'll see a world of change in how they play and how con- and their consistency I think is the big thing is just talk to them. There's so many parents, coaches, they want to just overpower their kids and their players that they go right in their shell. Yeah. Um, that's how I was. Um, just talk to them. That doesn't mean pamper them, but find a way to talk to them where you can still be negative, positive, and still building them at the same time, as, as weird as that may sound. <laughs> yeah. um, that's what I would take. Yeah, not weird at all. 
Guys, uh, thanks for listening to this episode of The Closing Pitch. Please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, follow us on Spotify, and subscribe on YouTube if you want to see Rafi's pretty face and Dave's buff body. Um, (laughs) (laughs) um, Go ahead and uh, give us a subscribe, and um, we'll we'll catch you in the next episode. Peace.